Hey guys. What a cool day so far, right? Can we get a round of applause for all the speakers so far? So, hello, my name is uh, Gabriel Valdivia. Um, I'm a product designer at Facebook, currently working on VR apps. Uh, before you ask, this is not a talk about what these guys like to eat for lunch. Uh, this is also not a uh, talk about what makes the best Cuban sandwich, though that would be really awesome. <laughs> this is uh, just to talk about my story so far and the lessons I learned along the way. Um, if nothing else, I want you to come away with two takeaways from this talk. One, I'm not special or gifted in any way, so if I can do it, so can you. And two, Silicon Valley actually desperately needs people like me in there. So let me just tell you a bit more about myself. I was born in a small town in Cuba called Santi Spiritus. Um, when my dad is a doctor and uh, my mom is an accountant, and I also have another brother who happens to be a designer as well. When I was eight years old, um, we actually moved to Costa Rica. At the time, if you have family in a different country, that could claim you into that country. And so my uncle had a cousin in Costa Rica who claimed him, and then he claimed us. In Costa Rica, my brother and I quickly fell in love with storytelling, whether it was by um, drawing comic books with each other, um, being in bands together, and eventually we fell in love with uh, the power of storytelling on design. So we decided to study design as a, as a career. And we quickly realized that Costa Rica was not the play, best place to do that. It's an awesome country if you want to study nature, but in terms of design, it, it felt like it was always trailing behind the US in terms of design trends. So we convinced our parents to pack everything they had and move to the US to study design. So we actually moved here to Tampa. Why Tampa? Well, my, uh, my, uh, my dad's sister lived here. So it just seemed like a natural step. So I'll admit that we lucked out. Uh, as Cubans, if you spend a, a year and a day in the US, uh, you can, uh, there's this thing called the Cuban Adjustment Act that after a year and a day, you can apply for a social security number. So it was easy for us, relatively speaking, to other immigrants. So we were able to get a tourist visa for six months and come to the, the US. And actually, uh, the, the other six months, we were undocumented until one day, we just uh, apply for a green card. So as you can imagine, it's hard to be an illegal immigrant in the US. At the time, um, we couldn't really get a driver's license, so it was hard for us to get around town. Uber didn't exist back then. Um, I would spend the weekdays struggling to understand English at late to high school, and at nights, me and my parents would go to dealerships in Florida Avenue to uh, clean them up and get extra money for rent. On the weekends, uh, I would take a variety of odd jobs, whether it's in construction, or um, changing floors, or even mowing lawns. So by the time I finished high school, um, I found out that I wasn't able to get into a state college because I didn't have enough credits, uh, given the fact that I have come here halfway through junior year. So I enrolled in the first college that would have me, which is actually this one. Um, I got into HEC uh, to study graphic design, and I eventually transferred to the Art Institute of Tampa to get my bachelor's. In school, um, I, joined, I worked in a bunch of uh, part-time jobs. One of those was at a call center. And this call center had a, uh, just one rule. You could do whatever you want with your time in between calls, uh, as long as when their phone rang, you would answer it. So a lot of people use this time to uh, do homework, um, study for tests, I used this time to sketch and watch video podcasts and movies. So during this time, I discovered this podcast called Dignation. Does anybody know what Dignation is here? No? OK. <laughs> so Dignation is this, uh, this video show, or was this video show, of these two guys sitting on a couch, drinking beer, and talking about tech. The guy on the left is Alex Albrecht, and the guy on the right is Kevin Rose. So they're just two regular, regular white dudes but for me, there were celebrities who spoke my language and talk about this magical land called Silicon Valley. I remember daydreaming about Silicon Valley at the time and thinking about working there in between calls and of angry customers calling me names and pretending not to understand my accent. I have an accent, by the way. 
So working at Silicon Valley for me felt like being an astronaut. Um, nobody really tells you you can't be an astronaut, but you somehow are conditioned to think that you have to be special or be at the right time, uh, the right moment to be an astronaut, right? Uh, this is not, this is what, it, was, it wasn't discriminatory, right? uh, it was very subconscious. I never felt victimized by it. It was just something that I thought was beyond the realm of what was possible. Well, it turns out this actually is a thing uh, called the horizon of aspiration, and we all have it. It's just the, the number of things that you can do that you feel are within your reach of possibilities. This happens to be inflated for minorities um, uh, who think that they can do less than they can actually do. But I found that constantly challenging those barriers and stepping outside your comfort zone can actually lead you to unimaginable results. In other words, just by knocking on the door, can often, you can often find out that it was open the whole time. So I remember three specific moments where I was able to look beyond my horizon of aspiration, and I want to share them with you today. So the first one was in school, in the, um, the Art Institute of Tampa. We had these portfolio reviews, and I remember one of my professors told me, yeah, your work looks pretty good, but you got to stop comparing yourself to other students and start comparing yourself to people outside of school. That, for me, was huge. It gave me license to go beyond just school and play in the, in the big leagues. So just a few weeks after that, I saw a tweet from a small uh, group of advertisers here called Ad2, you probably heard of them. So, and they, they reached out on that tweet and they asked for people to join them in, in a brainstorming meeting uh, at the Mint. So despite not knowing anybody at Ad2 and feeling pretty unqualified for it, I decided to show up. Well, that turned out to be one of the most amazing years of my life. We worked on a public service campaign called I Own Me, uh, aimed at raising awareness for, against domestic violence for teens. So one day, the creative director for that campaign had to step down, and they asked me to step in as creative director for the campaign, and eventually all of that too. That was uh, a great year where I met some great people and grew tremendously as a designer. It never would have happened if that professor hadn't unintentionally given me access or permission to look beyond the walls of the college. The second one, um, the second moment, was when I joined a company called Automatic in San Francisco. I was leading the design for them. At the time, I was living in LA, uh, working at a small design agency. And even though I loved LA, I always thought it was second to San Francisco. I really wanted to be in San Francisco. So one day, I went to LinkedIn and just changed my address to San Francisco and started applying at a bunch of companies there. <laughs> um, eventually, the CEO for Automatic reached out to me and asked if I wanted to interview. So there were just four Berkeley students at the time uh, working at a small office in downtown San Francisco. They didn't have a lot of money to offer. Um, but what they did offer was the opportunity to lead the design of the, of the product and show the world what I could do. Needless to say, I didn't feel qualified to do this. I never have worked at a startup before, let alone in San Francisco. And I had to be in charge of the design of the packaging, the website, the mobile apps, all of it. But somehow I decided to take the leap and just go with it. Well, that turned out to go from four people to about 30 people in the company by the time I left. Um, it was an incredible year. We worked on really tweaking this product and making it something that we were proud of, working on every detail tirelessly, until one day we actually launched. And it, was, it happened to be really well adopted and well accepted within the industry. And even Kevin Rose, the ex-host for Dick Nation, reached out to me to congratulate me on a, on a job well done. It was super surreal. The third moment is actually right now. Working at Facebook, and being in the stage here right now is something that I thought was completely impossible two months ago. I always thought that it would be totally impossible, not really because anybody said no, just because. I somehow had this idea that uh, working at a place like Facebook would mean breaking through stacks upon stacks of resumes in somebody's HR desk. How could I break through that noise? Like, who am I to break through that noise? But once you're inside, you realize that it doesn't have to be like that. 
It actually works under small town rules to a degree that you wouldn't even imagine. In my case, the work I did for Automatic was flagged to a recruiter within Facebook who then called me and got the ball started. Many of my coworkers have similar stories. Somebody at Facebook saw their work and connected them to a recruiter. Little did I know that Facebook actually desperately needs people like me. The reason they need people like me is because these tech companies want to build global products, products that are used for, by everyone in the world. To do that, you need people in your company that come from different backgrounds. You can't really build global products if we all come from the same background. Just like, just like our individual DNA influences what we do, the comp a company's DNA influences what they put out into the world. This is why a company needs to be, uh, come from a global DNA so they can put out intuitive and accessible products for everyone in the world. So this is why Silicon Valley needs people like, like you and me, people that can infect it with our culture and our differences. It's the only way we can break through the white people problem bubble and actually bring value to everyone in the world. As you can imagine, we have a lot of work to do here. Based on the survey run in the last couple of years, only 29% of people that work in the top seven tech companies are women, while 71% are male. These numbers are a lot more bleak when you split it up by race. We have about 60% of people that identify themselves as white, and 23% that identify as Asian. However, an alarmingly low 8% identify as Hispanics, and 7% as black. This is particularly alarming because Hispanic and black account alone account for more than 32% of the US population alone, and that is growing every, every year. So you can see how we're being grossly misrepresented by the companies that build the products that we love and use every day. The good news is that Silicon Valley has started to realize this and taken the first steps to bridging the gap between Silicon Valley and the rest of the world. For example, uh, one of the things that Facebook has adopted is this, this thing called the Diverse Slate Program, which is based on the Rooney Rule that originated in the NFL a while ago. What this, what this uh, rule requires teams to um, interview at least one minority candidate for every open position. It doesn't require that, that company to hire that minority candidate, but just the fact that they interview them gives everyone of all races an opportunity and, and a chance to, to play in the big leagues. However, finding these candidates is not easy. It takes a company to step outside their comfort zone and innovate beyond their usual methods of recruiting. The amount of minorities who actually apply for these jobs are simply not enough to fill a diverse workforce. This is why companies like Facebook have started to create, invest in expanding the talent pool and, and train people with the skills they need for these jobs. One example of this is Tech Prep, which is a program uh, created to bridge the gap between Silicon Valley and the rest of the world. It's an online resource dedicated to, to introduce minorities to programming and computer science. The goal is to spare interest into the field and motivate people from all backgrounds to pursue careers in tech. Facebook has also started investing in the way we look at minorities and create this course called Managing Your Unconscious Bias. And it, it forces you to confront your, yourself with your own bias, and it teaches you the impact of first impressions and the power of stereotypes. I will take you guys through the whole course right now, but I do encourage you, everyone to take it. It's available online for free. No matter your background, I'm sure it will reveal something. So as you can see, Silicon Valley is doing, starting to do a few things. However, there's also a couple of things that you can do to uh, help shorten that gap. So I have two, two things for you. One, you can use your perspective as your superpower. I know that it can be sometimes frustrating to look at a place like Silicon Valley or Hollywood and see it filled with people that look or act nothing like you. However, you're not inadequate for being different. You actually have a perspective that brings a ton of value to this white male-centric tech world. For example, you need to use blind as a suffix when you talk about minorities. Saying things like, 
I'm colorblind or sexual orientation blind actually neutralizes a part of a person that could be an asset. It's important to recognize character these characteristics and see them as adding value. So embrace what makes you different and try to recognize it, how it influences your work. You'd be surprised how it can bring value to, to companies like Facebook or Google. So at Facebook, we have this saying that I really love that says, people over pixels. As people who work on digital products, everything we do will inevitably be obsolete in just a few years. The code that we, that we write will be replaced by new libraries, and the visuals will be replaced by new visual trends. But the things that we can take are the relationships that we make as we, as we build these products. It's pretty straightforward to make relationships with the people you work with. But a lot of our stories involve special people that have really taken us to the next level. The thing is, you never know who that, that person may be. They might inspire you to become a better designer, or they might take you under their wing on, the, on their next venture. For example, I didn't know when I joined that too that it would lead me to this stage five years later. I also didn't know that answering that phone call from those Berkeley students would lead me to designing automatic and standing above my heroes. A referral from someone you know is one of the most powerful tools to getting in the door. So try to make meaningful connections with the people you'll come across. You'd be surprised how they can help you become the person you want to be. So don't get me wrong, you gotta focus on your craft. Make sure that's airtight. But if you focus on building pixels, oh, sorry, building relationships over better pixels, you have a chance of growing as a designer, as a person, and making the world a better place. So a lot of people would, would say that the odds for me to land in a place like Silicon Valley were not stacked in my favor. If you feel like you have been, been dealt a similar hand, I hope this this story brings you inspiration and allows you to look beyond your horizon of aspiration and use your perspective to bring value to companies like Facebook, Google, or whatever your dream job may be. Thank you. Yeah, what you want is a, is a percentage that springs a reasonable debate whenever these issues come up. Those numbers were compared against the US, but if you compare it against the world, they're vastly different, right? And these companies want, typically, to grow beyond just the US. And a problem that we're seeing today is that the products that we create are very Western you know, focused. And they don't really address the needs or the sensibilities of people in India or Africa. Um, because one of the main reasons is that their actual uh, working force doesn't reflect that. So there's no way somebody in, you know, in San Francisco can guess what is or is not offensive to someone in India or not. I think the hardest part is to build the confidence to see yourself within those walls. Uh, a lot of people put companies like that in the pedestal and they, me included, I saw it as an, as an impossibility. One of the things that helped me was mentors along the way who uh, gave me the, the confidence to, to really knock on those doors. Something else that you can do is just not wait for them to reach out to you and, and actually make products make things, and those things will not go unnoticed by those companies. Um, but yeah, one of, one of the biggest misconceptions is that there's this mystery around Silicon Valley and what it's trying to do, and a bit of an uh, uh, elite culture that they're trying to break down. Um, and you find that it's really hard for people in that side of the country to reach out to you know, places in like Georgia or uh, places in the U.S. that would typically not, not apply or knock on those doors. So it takes effort from the companies in Silicon Valley to reach out to them, as well as people to build themselves with the confidence to just knock on the doors. Yeah, um, well, we're, we're starting to get results from people actually implementing this. I don't have exact numbers, but I know that people uh, or companies that have a diverse workforce actually end up being more successful, more profitable. Um, we see it in our, in our day, today at uh, Facebook. We're getting more and more perspectives and more and more um, just voices from different sides of the world to really help us make a product that is more um, just accessible. And it, that translates into our product. We've released uh, things recently like internet.org or Facebook Lite are a few projects that have 
shape how Facebook itself adapts to different environments. And that has been incredibly successful. Totally, I think, I think that's definitely part of the problem as well. It's not just racial or gender or age. It's also cultural. Um, and I think it's just a sign of how mature a company is where you start uh, embracing all ways of being. Um, one of the ways we started doing that at Facebook is we don't really use the term culture fit because uh, it puts people into a bucket that is pretty narrow-minded. Um, what we want is people from all ages, all backgrounds. Because um, that, again, that influences the product in, the, in a way that is not just better for the world, but also better for the business itself. Um, so if you think of it as having different voices from different perspectives, that can cover race, gender, and just cultural background. Yeah, um, you know, Facebook is uh, about 10 years behind Google. Uh, so although it's a very different company than Google, um, they, they're, they're very similar in many, many ways. So um, Facebook has this, this, this goal of making the world more open and connected, uh, which is it's a pretty altruistic goal, and they want to accomplish that uh, through you know, whatever means necessary. Uh, so that, that means adapting their product uh, to make sure it accomplishes that goal. So we recently started to invest in artificial intelligence, virtual reality, uh, bringing internet to um, emerging markets, things like that that go beyond just a website or a social network. Yeah, so the, the good thing is that Facebook, in order to achieve that, um, you know, we, we've been able to, to aim that high now that, that we've shown success over the past 10 years. So we invest a lot in um, traveling uh, and really having one-on-one -on -one interactions with the people that use our products, for example. So I, I work as a designer, and you could, you could simplify my work as you know, making pixels on the screen. Uh, but very often, maybe multiple times a year, we go to remote places like India or Indonesia or Brazil, places that we wouldn't typically go, and we talk one-on-one -on -one with the people that use our product. Because when you design for one and a half billion people, you stop thinking of them as people and you think of them as numbers. And that is the worst thing you could do for your product. So, we're fortunate enough that we can actually invest in uh, having a one-on-one -on -one interaction with the people that use the product, and that really generates a lot of empathy um, to see how they could, that could be using the product in ways that you can never imagine. One of my favorite quotes is, um, or stories is from uh, this guy on Instagram that uses uh, Instagram solely to sell goats. That is the only way, uh, the, only, the only way he makes a living. It's selling goats on Instagram, and you can imagine people that made Instagram didn't make it so that people could sell goats on it. Um, so so that, that's the kind of insight that you get when you just see people face to face that use your product. Facebook is a very special place. Um, they, they have this mantra of, making, of, of cultivating your authentic self. Um, it's a social network, right? So it's a very social company, and you know, they allow people of all backgrounds in. Um, so you could, in any given day, you could walk around the hallways and see somebody in costume, somebody in drag, somebody skating through the hallways. It's very accepting. Um, and that is because we, again, our, our target market is the world. So we don't really want to make a product that's only acceptable for, you know, white male uh, hipsters, you know, um, even though we got plenty of those. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's very varied, um, and if, if it were successful, I, it would be like answering the question of how do you see the culture of the world. There, there's, there's a certain level of acceptance to pursue your own, um, your own path. Uh, so there's this, this thing called the 20% time, which you can do whatever you want with your time one day a week. Um, and we have hackathons every few months where uh, over 24 to 48 hours, you can gather engineers and build whatever you want. And these are some of the best engineers in the world, so you can imagine, you can build things, you can have an idea and, and build it in just a couple of days. Um, and some of these products actually make it through the pipeline and, and our ship products. Um, the chatting, uh, Facebook chat or Messenger was built um, out of a hackathon, um, the first version of ads and so on. There, there's a lot of, of examples of that that come from the bottoms up um, 
So in terms of entrepreneurship, there is a lot of, uh, of it happening in-house. In um, but at the same time, there's also plenty of, of success stories of people that have left Facebook, and Facebook continues to support them and uh, into whatever they do. Thank you, guys.